This audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. Chapter 9 Anarchists Behind the Walls Social War in Temperate Climates James Lovelock says that in the predicted climate catastrophe, what is at risk is civilization. I am unfortunately less optimistic. Civilization, in some form or other, will persist, at least in many regions. It is no accident that the first civilization to spread globally originates in temperate Europe. Many other civilizations raised up empires only to destroy their environments and collapse. The oceanic temperate climate gave Western European civilization a wider margin of error, enabling civilization to escape its own regional locality and devour much of the earth. As with other civilizations, it leaves deserts in its footprints. But, being global in reach but temperate in origin, the physical deserts are largely elsewhere. Thus, some of the key countries historically responsible for global heating will be the least dramatically affected by it, at least directly. While those large capitalist core countries that span multiple climate zones – Australia, USA, Russia – may see considerable direct disruption, under most models those living in temperate zones, especially oceanic and mountainous lands, can expect a heated yet relatively calm climate punctuated by extreme events. To a very large degree, the forecast for social war is likely to be similar to that of climate forecast – heated yet relatively calm – while punctuated by extreme events. Relative, that is, to situations elsewhere on a rapidly heating and conflicted planet, not relative to social and climate situations today. Mediterranean lands will probably get far hotter in both senses, and this may favour the growth of anarchists in a spreading version of what Europol has referred to as the Mediterranean Triangle of Anarchist Violence. Generally speaking, the landlocked temperate countries in the middle of continents are likely to see their summers get considerably hotter, with some such as Lovelock even predicting the functional collapse of existing agricultural forms. In the film Children of Men, countries worldwide seem to be engulfed in famine, insurrection, civil war, epidemics and natural disasters. Meanwhile, Britain soldiers on with a banal authoritarian system that sees most people continuing in their assigned class roles and travelling daily to work as much of the planet seemingly implodes around them. Polyglot refugees in vast numbers are imprisoned in a seaside ghetto town. Such a picture could be an image from the future climate for not just the Britain Isles, but many temperate countries, especially those states with oceanic borders, which both moderate climactic extremes and enable easier border control, such as New Zealand, Tasmania, etc. While conformity and social coping will, I suspect, remain the norm, increasingly authoritarian conditions and the economic effects of global dislocation will occasionally ferment spectacular episodes of class anger and the wider formation of dissident cultures, however marginal. Gord Hill of the Kwakwakawak Nation may have it about right. Quote, the convergence of war, economic decline, and ecological crisis will lead to greater overall social conflict within the imperialist nations in the years to come. It is this growing conflict that will create changes in the present social conditions, with greater opportunities for organized resistance. The rulers are well aware of this, and it is for this reason that state repression is now being established as a primary means of social control, i.e. greatly expanded police military forces, new terror laws, etc. We are now in a period that can be described as the calm before the storm." End quote. Mirroring Gord Hill, but from a status perspective, the UK chief scientist has warned of a perfect storm in 2030 due to potential shortages of water, food and energy that could result in, quote, major destabilization, an increase in rioting and potentially significant problems with international migration as people move out to avoid food and water shortages, end quote. Though this storm may initially break elsewhere, those states and their captives that rely heavily on international trade will be hit. Such a picture of social conflict should not give the false impression that the coming troubles will result in some kind of libertarian social transcendence. To suspect the future will see an increase in trouble and that some of those troubles will be us does not presume any form of overall victory. Rather, social crises are inevitable in societies based on class warfare and will only be exaggerated by the emerging conditions. Additionally, it would be unwise to ignore the pacifying effect of everywhere else being perceived as worse. 
In Chapter 3, Desert Storms, we looked at how lands such as America and the British Isles, etc., may fall back into a combination of policies that add up to quarantine, and it would be naive to think this would be a policy favoured by states only. Indeed, we can expect stronger calls for more borders to come from across classes. In contrast, Lovelock has, some may be surprised to find, an optimistic view. Quote, Scandinavia and the oceanic parts of northern Europe, such as the British Isles, may be spared the worst of heat and drought that global heating brings. This puts a special responsibility upon us to give refuge to the unimaginably large influx of climate refugees. End quote. Legal immigration today is class and, to a certain extent, race selective, and this is likely to become only more the case. Overall struggles are extremely unlikely to change this, though when focused on individuals will no doubt continue to have some great successes. While those of us living behind the walls may be shielded from some of the more overt and large-scale conflicts and opportunities that are likely to characterize this century, the social war is all around us. The lack of overt civil war is merely a sign of the depth of our domestication, as in most places, the policing needs only be sporadic. Pecking orders are almost everywhere, and from the boredom, pain and indignity of wage labour to our exclusion of the land community, we live in and are occupied territory. If we disregard the illogic of private property and take food or shelter when needed, we risk facing security guards, bailiffs, police and prisons. Though largely absent from the spectacle, the class casualties mount up. In my country, the richest live on average 10 years longer than the poorest, and one of the greatest single predictors of fatal heart disease, thanks to social stress, is how low one is in a hierarchy. Just as worldwide, more people kill themselves than get killed in wars and through interpersonal violence, in Britain, suicide remains the highest single cause of death for both males and females aged 15 to 34. Assimilation is painful, and trauma, self-harm, abuse, and addiction are rife. As Raoul Venegam said, for many, quote, the greatest kept state secret is the misery of everyday life, end quote. Our lives can be better, freer, and wilder than this, and as anarchists, we do our utmost to make them so, not in the ever after of post-revolutionary heaven, but now. Nevertheless, despite being anarchists, many of us find ourselves in relatively temperate social climates, far from overt conflict, on the scale likely to be seen beyond the walls. This brings both advantages and disadvantages. Surveillance states and security cultures. The fortress faces inwards as well as out. Increasingly new technologies of control are brought in under the justification of fear of the barbarians, whether of terrorists or migrants. Somewhat evocative of sci-fi dystopias, not to mention the Gaza Strip, covert surveillance drones are already flying British skies introduced initially for maritime border control, a public justification which the police themselves admit is largely a ruse. In many countries, cameras, some now with microphones, proliferate to the point of being practically invisible, not because they are covert, but because they have been normalized. Pervasive technologies of control, many even paid for by ourselves and adopted voluntarily, such as mobiles, computers, bank cards and road cameras with number plate recognition, map social networks, changing affiliations and physical movements. New communication technologies equals new ways of making us talk. When these technologies are combined with old-fashioned human intelligence, Gathered by informers and infiltrators operating within resistant communities, states and corporations can gain a level of oversight that would have been unthought of even a few decades ago. Whether or not control technologies converge to create an intelligence state that understands everyone rather than merely gathers data on them is yet to be seen, but against those pre-existing cultures of opposition, the lenses are very much already focused. Sadly, much of the focusing is done by us. Quote, the fact that our tyrannical enemy no longer draws its power from its ability to shut people up, but from its aptitude to make them talk, i.e., from the fact that it has moved its center of gravity from its mastery of the world itself to its seizure of the world's mode of disclosure, requires that a few tactical adjustments be made. End quote. Silence and beyond. Tikhan 1. 
A limited response would be, along with abandoning any dialogue with power and spectacle, relinquishing the use of new, near-universal communication technologies. Though this may have wider lifestyle benefits, it may also increasingly make oneself stand out. According to a UK military midterm future projection, quote, by the end of the period, 2036, it is likely that the majority of the global population will find it difficult to turn the outside world off. ICT, information and communication technology, is likely to be so pervasive that people are permanently connected to a network or two-way data stream with inherent challenges to civil liberties. Being disconnected could be considered suspicious, end quote. We are moving to such a future fast. When the French anti-terrorist police invaded the land community in Tarnak in 2008, one of the public justifications they gave for suspecting that a terrorist cell was forming was that few on the land had mobiles. The agreed convention is that the first step for those who, having planned the future, now wish to bring it about is to make oneself known, make one's voice heard, speak truth to power. Yet the listener imposes the terms, not the talker. Much of the low-level contestation that characterizes activism and the limited social spaces that make up countercultures actively mark out areas and people in need of potential policing. That's not to say that all resistance is futile if meaningful, achievable objectives are kept in mind and tactics not transformed into aims. Nor that we should desist from growing communities in which to live and love. Rather, that we would be wise to understand that many subversive actions and social relations increasingly serve the needs of power as well as liberty. The balance of advantage should always be taken into consideration. We need to always ask ourselves the question, to what extent is the planned action or method of social relationship likely to hemorrhage data on potentially resistive identities? With increasingly powerful surveillance states and storms approaching, our responsibility to each other, especially to those as yet unimplicated, grows. Yet, despite this contradiction, if we don't believe in a global revolutionary future, we must live, as we in fact always had to, in the present. Shelves overflow with histories of past struggles and hallucinations of the post-revolutionary future, whilst surprisingly little has been written about anarchist life under, not after, capitalism. Yet that is where most of us in temperate regions are, and where most of us are likely to remain. Quote, The state is not something which can be destroyed by a revolution, but is a condition, a certain relationship between human beings, a mode of human behaviour. We destroy it by contracting other relationships, by behaving differently. End quote. Gustav Landauer. In many places, we are behaving differently by spreading love and cooperation and resisting and or avoiding those who would be our masters. One of the strengths of anarchist currents has always been the desire and attempt to live our ethics now. One does not need to believe, as many have, that countercultures are prefigurative to see their value. After all, whilst in most temperate places, anarchist subcultures are not new worlds for the future, they still remain barracks and sanctuaries for today. This is nothing new, even if it does seem, in its own small way, to once again be becoming more widespread. The classical anarchist period was propelled forward primarily by peasant insurgencies, think Zapata and the Mechnovica, and essentially bohemian, mostly urban anarchist counter-societies, to use Murray Bookchin's term for the worlds created by Spanish anarchists before the fascist counter-revolution. From Spain pre-1936 to the Jewish anarchists in North America, the illegalists of France and the Italian anarcho-syndicalists of Argentina, the inhabitants of anarchist counter-societies were always, by definition, active minorities. The minorities may have gotten larger in insurrectionary moments, but they remained minorities always. The same can be said for libertarian subcultures ever since. For the foreseeable future, libertarians in temperate regions will remain minorities, even as possibilities for widespread anarchy arise beyond the walls. There are many things we can do, but we cannot change the fact that we will not be joined voluntarily and actively by most citizens. We will always be within and against, and this may become increasingly dangerous for all involved. I live in an area with a sizable anarchist subculture. I like living amongst people who make my life lovelier in a society not of my choosing, 
and with whom I can continue to engage in resistance. Such clustering is unfortunately almost designed to attract unwanted attention. We should hold no illusions about our ability to be simultaneously open to the world, yet closed to the state, but security culture measures can minimize the damage. In the end though, our security rests primarily on the wider society, not simply the practices of the subcultures we create. Governments would no doubt lock far more of us away than they do, but for now, in many countries at least, there is some protection in the state's fear that increased repression risks widening resistance and more generally breaking the spell of illusory social peace. Countercultures need embedded security to survive, but our main security lies hidden in the wider culture. When we choose which interventions, campaigns and struggles to fight, and which locations to live in, we should select them where we can, partly on their potential for social contagion, for the presence of factors that link us and our desires, ethics and needs to those of the surrounding society. Doing so is self-protective. Beyond our own security, choosing battles based on where people already are and linking the anarchies we are growing with existing ecologies, social relations and gains from previous struggles has the significant advantage of making anarchy more translatable. As Colin Ward said, quote, Many years of attempting to be an anarchist propagandist have convinced me that we win over our fellow citizens to anarchist ideas precisely through drawing upon the common experience of the informal, transient, self-organizing networks of relationships that in fact make the human community possible, rather than through the rejecting of existing society as a whole in favor of some future society where some different kind of humanity will live in perfect harmony." End quote. Seeking out other elements, other allies, wider compatible social relations enable us to learn from them, aid them, and be aided in return. That's not to say we should dilute ourselves. We are anarchists. What strengths we have arise from our desires and active decisions to live freer and wilder as communities, as individuals. False unity with authoritarian social forces only weakens us. In our own small ways, where we exist, libertarian communities of resistance are gathering resources and growing connections of mutual aid in the cities, re-inhabiting and defending the land, and trying to grow a fighting spirit. We can do far better, but we have started. Subcultures are part of the encompassing society, and thus one of the characters is that their practices can seep out into the surrounding culture, often in a deformed way, but not always entirely washed clean of their ethics and healthiness, or otherwise as the case may be. Horrific as the situation today is, it would be worse still if it was not for resistance and the unforeseen effects of people trying to live well. Just as we cannot save the world, we will not reclaim the future. Nevertheless, we will be part of it. We are not the seed of the future society in the shell of the old, but one of many elements from which the future is forming. Resist much, obey little. When resistance and desertion significantly threaten those in power, repression, counter-revolution is inevitable. One answer to how to make countercultures less of a threat to those within them would be to drain them of antagonism, make them obviously unthreatening to power. This counsel of evasion and non-resistance has long been articulated in the lived experience of anarchies both outside civilization and within. Today though, putting aside the ethical issues involved, the fact is that while you can try and ignore the state, if you're within its controlled territory, the chances are that the state won't ignore you. Those communities with a land base capable of some level of self-sufficiency will still face intervention, whilst those immersed in capitalism will often have little option but to labour, and lacking resistance for worsening hours and wages. Another answer, and noticeably it's the one many of us have taken, explicitly or not, is to resist, preferably in winnable campaigns, but barring wider social crisis, usually at a somewhat muted level, all the time attempting some level of invisibility. Given where we find ourselves, a lot of what we already do makes sense, even when the overt justifications of such action remain mired in visions of salvation, as outlined in chapter 1. Ironically, these practical actions are sometimes abandoned when it is realized correctly that they will not lead to the transformation of the world. Just as countercultures, communes, communities of resistance may not be embryos of a future mass anarchist society, direct action may not lead to the destruction of capitalism, but it does protect some threatened ecosystems, helps many of us, and stops the future erosion of some liberties. 
Strax and syndicalism may not be steps towards a future anarcho-communism, but they may aid survival in the here and now and open up time in which to live better. Riots may not lead to revolution, but they can break the social spell for many. I wouldn't pretend for a moment that we are significantly slowing the death march that civilization is taking life on Earth, but the weapons of the weak are the ones they have, not the ones they dream of. The most fertile ground for resistance over the last 30 years has been neither underground or above ground, but in the networked space between the two. As noted earlier in discussion of increased surveillance, this ground may be disappearing from under our feet, irrelevant of arguments of its utility. For resistance cultures that are often skewed generationally towards the young, it's often easy to forget how fast options narrow. There was a time, not many decades ago, when police had no riot uniforms and had to use metal rubbish bin lids as improvised round shields amidst an inner city insurgency. Not so long ago, animal liberationists could break into laboratories where no motion sensor would pick them up because they hadn't been invented. Charities could openly run fundraising pushes for medical support for armed liberation movements abroad through the National Union of Students. This is no call for 1980s nostalgia. By others' reports, in many ways, things are far better now, but some avenues have closed and more will follow them. To an extent, a lot of the type of actions that will become increasingly difficult, especially the spectacular stuff, could be dumped with little loss anyway. Often their only purpose is to make people feel like they are doing politics. However, some victories and successful campaigns have achieved real gains, defended real people and places, and often with tactics which may be decreasing in viability. What then are the other side thinking is the future of resistance? For a start, we should be clear that we are by no means viewed as the only or even the main resistive social force. Unhappiness, poverty, social division, irrationality, and the desire to fight abound, and many in elites understand that the potential for chaos is often barely under wraps. As pointed to earlier in the discussion of the rise of megacities, state theorists often do not make the mistake of seeing economic crime as divorced from the wider class war. In terms of the strictly political, Many activists seemed rather miffed when September 11 and the growth of Islamic terrorism upstaged the movement of movements, which a decade ago was meant to be the only game in town. The growth, limited as it is, of non-state authoritarian actors, whether Al-Qaeda wannabes or far-right race soldiers, shows that there are many potentially insurgent subcultures behind the walls, many of which are our enemies as much as the states are. Colonel Thomas X. Hames, U.S. Marine Corps, in his influential book, The Sling and the Stone, popularized the idea of fourth and fifth generation war. Some military theorists have long divided different forms of modern conflict into generations. In the most common schema, first generation war, 1GW, is characterized by the emergence of conflicts involving massive armies culminating in the Napoleonic Wars, 2GW, by industrialized World War I style conflicts, and 3GW by World War II style blitzkrieg. 4GW was developed in theory and practice by Mao and includes, amongst others, the wars in China, Vietnam, Somalia, Gaza, Iraq, following the succession of 3GW blitzkrieg invasion, as well as the so-called War on Terror. This is a vastly simplified version of the scheme, but you get the idea. Haim spends most of the book explaining 4GW, pointing out that this is a form of war the US and co are and will be fighting for some time, and that, at least in the 20th century, it is the only type of war that it has lost. The Western states have mostly been pretty successful in stopping 4G terror incidents happening within their borders for a whole host of reasons, not least of which has been their increasing capacity for effective surveillance of networks. Haim states that, quote, Fourth generation war is more than 70 years old and is reaching maturity. While we are only beginning to understand it clearly, history tells us the fifth generation has already begun to evolve, end quote. He's open about saying it's too early to tell, but his best guess is that 5GW may be carried out by the super empowered individuals or small groups who, unlike 4GW, are not embedded within wider networks and therefore far less visible. This is pretty much a description of how much of the ELF and ALF have betrayed themselves, though rarely a description of reality. 
As the successful repression of networks from 80s animal liberation to the 90s green scare show, it also resonates somehow with the increasing appearance of lone wolf attacks across the oppositional spectrum. It is worth pointing out that super empowered in Hames's sense doesn't just mean an overabundance of Nietzschean self-belief, but the force magnifying effect of high technology. Earlier, we looked at military thinking about insurgency in the new megacities of the majority world, but those who would maintain the submissive peace also remember the LA uprising and are rapidly militarizing as they await its return. The extent of apocalyptic thinking amongst elites and the failure of oppressed classes to often live up to them was most evident in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. Yet, even in the day-to-day -day absence of such uprisings, there are and will be opportunities to intervene and participate in moments of wider social and ecological struggle, to show leadership from below, help instill a fighting spirit, and provide important infrastructure. Success often comes when upsurges seem to appear out of nowhere, but benefit from the will and experience residing in established communities of resistance. Politicos often want to push these moments beyond their natural lifespan, but momentum lasts only so long, and it doesn't take much time for the state to organize. Such situations will not be the foundation for a total libertarian transformation of the world, yet they do have a chance of occasionally achieving real class gains, defending communities and ecologies, making people safer, showing people their own capacity, and breaking social spells. They can obviously be costly, both in terms of repression and the calming power of having let off steam. We should also be under no illusion that authoritarian social forces on both sides of the barricades will not try and control such moments for their own uses. It seems then, at least in the minds of some of our enemies, that the main offensive forms that resistance will take in more surveyed and grating future temperate worlds will be those of unnetworked, super-empowered small groups and individuals, and largely unmanaged episodes of mass social opposition. For now, a middle ground also exists, mostly occupied by activism and crime, but maybe for not much longer. As I said earlier, subversive actions serve the needs of power as well as liberty, so toleration may last longer than strictly technologically necessary if it plays the role of inhibiting emerging forms of action. It should also be obvious that the oppositional forms so far mentioned, existent or yet to appear, are methods of opposition, not enablers of transcendence or ending. This will not stop them being claimed as such. In our circles, some communists will no doubt see social struggles and outbreaks of disorder as leading to transcendence, while some primitivists will see 5GW as a way of ending civilization in its heartlands. Situations in far-off lands also call, and those behind the walls can get out, at least at the moment. It is often dangerous to go where battlestorms are brewing, potentially for anarchies opening up and ecologies needing defense, but some always prefer liberty with danger over peace with slavery. Even some of those who don't may feel obligation to fight, either to a level that may be unsustainable under surveillance states, or with wild places and peoples, which, in much but by no means all of the temporal world, are increasingly few and far between. Despite the denials, civilizations still have many outsides, and as I have argued in earlier chapters, global heating will probably expand many of them. Love, Health, and Insurrection Quote, it is in my opinion that the situation is hopeless, that the human race has produced an ecological tip-over point. But assuming there is a possibility of changing the society's course in the darkness deathward set, it can only be done by infection, infiltration, diffusion, and imperceptibility microscopically throughout the social organism, like the invisible pellets of a disease called health. End quote. Kenneth Rexroth, anarchist and poet, July 1969. We have chosen to be anarchists, presumably at least in part because we feel it is more healthy and ethical to be so. It is better not to be bosses and servants in our intimate and social relationships. Turning the pain we feel into resistance is better than turning it on each other, our own class and our own bodies. It is environmentally healthier, to use a degraded term, to defend wild freedoms than let all of Earth become civilization's territory. If Rex Roth were alive today, he would not be surprised that it is now probably too late to change the course in the darkness deathward set. Yet those of us who have chosen to be anarchists in some of the most domesticated places on earth still need to find each other, both to be effective and to be socially rounded. We have to maintain some invisibility from power while still being socially present enough to be contagious. 
Too often, some people's activism resembles the manic phase of bipolar disorder. This is followed inevitably by a depressive phase, which once having disillusioned folks of feelings of omnipotence only reinforces illusions of powerlessness. To become stronger and healthier and encourage and support others to do so, it is sensible to set ourselves realizable short-term goals rather than adopting an all-or-nothing perspective. This is the case whether it is in what we want our resistance to achieve, what we want to actively create, what we want to learn, or simply what we want to become. In this way, our conscious action can take on the function of collective therapy, making our lives measurably improves for being anarchists, while achieving wider social and ecological gains. There are many answers on how we can do this. We are anarcho-syndicalists on the shop floor, green anarchists in the woods, social anarchists in our communities, individualists when you catch us alone, anarcho-communists when there's something to share, insurrectionists when there's a strike to blow. An anarchism with plenty of adjectives, but one that also sets and achieves objectives, can have a wonderful present and still have a future, even when fundamentally out of the step with the world around it. There is so much we can do, achieve, defend, and be, even here, where unfortunately civilization probably still has a future. This has been a production of Audible Anarchist. You can find more Audible Anarchist on YouTube.